Dr. Ray Grant is staff neurologist in the Mellon Center for MS Treatment and Research and in the Center for Brain Health at the Cleveland Clinic. He also serves as director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Continuing Education. He holds an appointment as clinical associate professor in the Department of Medicine within the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Reagan completed his medical studies at McMaster University and his neurology residency at the University of Western Ontario. He has been a member of the Cleveland Clinic staff since 2007 and divides his time between clinical research and teaching activities. He has published many articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals and he has co-edited several books including Multiple Sclerosis and Related Disorders, Clinical Guide to Diagnosis, Medical Management, and Rehabilitation, which was published in 2013. Hello, I'm Alex Ray Grant, a staff neurologist at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I have the pleasure of talking to you today about cognitive impairment and multiple sclerosis, a very common and a very important topic in this area. So hopefully we can review this in some detail give you sort of a sense of where we are with this uh, clinical problem. We'll be talking about a variety of topics within this prevalence, the character of cognitive impairment in MS, the impact it has on people with MS, treatment strategies that have been tried, uh, modalities for testing, particularly for screening. We'll also talk about the novel concept of isolated cognitive relapses and discuss what pathologies may underlie cognitive impairment in multiple sclerosis. So first let's do a little question here. So how often do you think cognition is impaired in the multiple sclerosis population? So in fact, there have been a lot of different studies, primarily in the 80s and early 90s, on the prevalence of cognitive dysfunction MS. And depending on the neuropsychological tools that are used, Prevalence can really be around 60%, uh, even in patients with relapsing multiple sclerosis. So I think a lot of us are surprised by these numbers, but these have been borne out in study after study. And so we really think about this as a very important part of MS care is to be aware and looking at this dynamic within multiple sclerosis. Now, the character of the cognitive impairment is somewhat different from conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. This is a pivotal study by Dr. Stephen Rayo in looking at different types of cognitive information processing and uh, the impairment. And what you can see is that uh, areas that are most impaired are information processing, that is processing speed, uh, some memory tasks, and less significantly impaired are language and attention span and uh, intermediately are visual, spatial, and problem solving. So while the, the cognitive dysfunction goes across the board, there are certain areas that are more affected. And I think you'll agree that your patients will tell you that they have a couple of problems. They say that it takes them longer to think their way through information, that it takes more time to process. They'll tell you also that they have more trouble multitasking. That is, they have more trouble doing more than one thing at a time. And uh, that's really the kind of problems that people begin to have. When we look at the impact on daily functioning of cognitive impairment, we see that uh, people with MS who are cognitively impaired, compared to those who are cognitively intact, have significantly more problems in the work domain, with social activities, require more personal assistance, require more community services, need more help with finances, have more trouble with transportation, and have more problems with their residents than patients who are intact. So it does mean that this group has a more significant burden in terms of day-to-day -day impact of their disease. Now, when we look at the literature on cognitive impairments in MS, there's a variety of different types of deficits noted in the literature. So sometimes people have problems with free recall from long-term memory, bringing out those items that they already have known for a long time. 
Again, we talked about speed of information processing. It just takes longer for people to do what they need to do. They may have some trouble with working memory, and they may have problems with abstract reasoning at times, and they may have some impairment in complex attentional tasks. However, what's relatively spared is semantic knowledge, uh, short-term memory, implicit learning, and recognition of known facts. They've also been shown to have some problems with executive functioning with some planning, problem-solving, and self-monitoring function deficits. And so there may be some impairment in insight into uh, issues that are occurring. There was an interesting poster at uh, the Actrum's meeting in 2008 showing that when testing people with theory of mind tasks, that is trying to read facial expressions of uh, pictures or a faux pas testing, patients with multiple sclerosis and cognitive impairment have more problems than others. And so that may be another index of what's going on. And let's talk briefly about, further about the impact uh, where it's been looked at, cognitive impairment is associated with restricted participation in a number of activities, domestic, leisure, and outdoor activities. And this is from an observational study of 200 MS patients with mild physical disability. And so really it, it continues to uh, be that patients with cognitive dysfunction have really more problems in a number of areas of activity, including those activities that they should be enjoying. Now, in terms of treatment, there have not been uh, multiple validated long-term trials of treatment strategies in uh, uh, cognitive impairment and multiple sclerosis. We know that affective disturbances can affect reporting of cognition, so patients who are depressed will report that their cognition is impaired. But there have been no good studies looking at treating depression or other affective disorders and that, that treatment's impact on cognition. However, it's certainly something to think of. There are a number of trials, and, and I've just listed some of the treatment trials, looking at cognitive measures and patients who go on treatment for disease modification versus those who don't. I think the summary statement is there's some low-level data that supports treatment as possibly slowing cognitive impairment in in the uh, MS population. However, that doesn't appear to be a primary uh, approach to treatment. We certainly know that trying to prevent disease progression overall theoretically should reduce cognitive impairment over time, similar to the reduction that occurs with other disease measures, such as uh, mobility and sensory deficits. In terms of other more specific treatments, a number of relatively small, usually single center treatment trials have been performed in the cognitive sphere in MS over the years. Amantadine in one study showed a positive effect in mild to moderate impairment, and in a single center study, denepazil showed a positive effect. Unfortunately, denepazil was restudied by uh, Dr. Krupp and others in a multi center trial, and they were not able to reconfirm a significant beneficial effect of denepazil. There have been other small studies of stimulant medications with some low-level evidence for positivity, but again, there's no well-defined benefit <clears throat> of medications in cognition that's been validated. It does, however, probably make sense to ap approach this with a general brain health strategy. And so in the literature on uh, cognitive health, there are a number of factors that are shown to be potentially beneficial. For example, good sleep hygiene does seem to have benefit on cognitive function, and many patients with MS have impaired sleep due to a variety of factors. Uh, again, we talked about the treatment of depression and anxiety. It does make sense to search for this and to consider treating this in a general brain health strategy. In addition, many patients with multiple sclerosis end up being on multiple medications during their treatment. For example, they may end up on uh, muscle relaxant medication. They may be on pain medication. They may be on sedating 
antidepressants. They may be on nighttime sleeping medications. And so a, a careful and conscious review of their medication list might be helpful in their general care and may reduce some cognitive impairment. I will bring your attention to an FDA advisory on uh, statin medications that occasionally people going on statin medications may have some cognitive impairment. It appears to be idiosyncratic. It's not clear why this occurs, but it certainly is something to think of that's often not thought of in terms of assessing medications. Uh, certainly, one might look at the same kinds of risk factors one does in a cognitive disorder program, and so thinking about uh, looking at vitamin B12 deficiency or hypothyroidism, as are the guidelines for assessment for cognitive impairment, might make sense. In addition, your patients with multiple sclerosis are not in any way immune to developing other cognitive disorders, such as dementing disorders of, uh, for example, Alzheimer's, and so thinking about whether or not it is the MS that's causing cognitive impairment or some other disease may make some sense. There is some data on social engagement and exercise in the general brain health uh, prevention strategy area, and so it may be worth discussing with your patients both of these, which have obviously benefits in other spheres as well as cognition. However, there's been limited data on this in the MS world. As I was saying, there's a number of medication potential negative cognitive effects, and it's worth looking at the list. Uh, in terms of steroids, there's some data that during high-dose steroid treatment, some patients do experience transient cognitive impairment, and so that can be something to consider. So let's do another uh, multiple-choice question. The following is correct. The mini-mental status is an effective screen for MS cognitive impairment. Only formal neuropsychological evaluation works. Some patients with MS depression feel they are cognitively impaired, or visual spatial function is most affected in MS. I think we've already, in some ways, mentioned the answer. Some patients with MS depression do feel that they are cognitively impaired, and so you have to be cautious about the report of cognitive impairment. So let's go to an important criteria. So we know that now that cognitive impairment is both a frequent phenomenon and a phenomenon of significance in the patient population with MS. How would you go about testing it? Well, unfortunately, the standard neurological examination is relatively insensitive to the presence of cognitive impairment in MS. And so some kind of cognitive screening or testing is probably necessary to ascertain this, particularly when we know that some patients will attest to having cognitive impairment when really on measurement they have depression or other affectual disorders. It is important for us to have some paradigm to test for this. So there's re reasonably good data that the minimal status test, which most neurologists are fairly comfortable with, has a limited utility. The reason is this tends to miss most MS-related cognitive deficits. In one study from the early 90s, only 28% of a cohort with cognitive impairment were picked up by the minimal status. The PASAT test is a very effective measure of processing speed and actually a measure that's used in the multiple sclerosis functional composite scale for research trials. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to use clinically it requires mathematic skills, and there's a significant um, training effect of this if it's done uh, frequently. So most clinicians do not find PASAT easy to use, though certainly if you have a comfort level with this test, it, it could certainly be performed. The uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, which is freely available uh, from the website, it uh, has three English versions and about 30 different language versions. And it is a good global screen, which has been shown to have some correlation MS with executive functions, speed of processing, learning, and delayed recall compared with neuropsychology battery. And so certainly, if you're comfortable with the MOCA test, it's a relatively quick screen. In the clinic, this may take five to 10 minutes to perform and uh, is a, a well-designed test. Here's just an example. 
of the MOCA test. And this can be, again, obtained from the Internet uh, without charge. Now, a, um, a well-validated measure is the neuropsychology screening questionnaire. And this is a self-administered questionnaire for the clinic or office setting. So you could have uh, the patient and an informant fill this out and then look this over and score it. So the amount of time for the uh, tester is limited. And this uh, is, uh, has been recognized as identifying MS patients at risk for neuropsychological impairment, but you do need both the informant and patient component. And this says, uh, compared to the neuropsychology testing, has a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. Now what's interesting about this is if the informant says the patient is elevated on their score, the patient is at high risk for neuropsychiatric impairment. However, if the patient report is elevated, they're at high risk for either depression or neuropsychiatric impairment. So again, you need some kind of informant information to help you out with that distinction. This is just part of the scale showing uh, some of the demographic information and the kinds of questions that are done. When we come to the symbol digit modalities test, and the symbol digit modality test is a fairly straightforward test in which the uh, participant is taught that they need to connect a, uh, a number with a symbol and uh, do this uh, throughout uh, a process of time, usually 90 minutes. And they're scored on the number of correct uh, answers. And so this does not require a mathematics skills. Uh, it is a timed test and it does correlate with processing speed and cognitive impairment in MS. and has been uh, validated a number of times and uh, appears to be the, by and large, the shortest reasonable screening test. Now, there are batteries of tests that have been reviewed and looked at by international panels uh, for assessment of MS cognition, but most of the batteries uh, take a certain amount of time including uh, the Mac Fims, um, uh battery. Uh, but uh, if you have time and the uh, luxury to incorporate something like that, you can look at some of the uh, internationally recognized batteries. Going back to the symbol digit modality test, the um, age match controls perform better on this than MS, and these were the uh, number cutoffs. And so the uh, in this study, in Parmenter et al., a score of 55 or lower resulted in zero false positives and a true positives at a reasonable rate. I wanted to bring to your attention observations, and these actually go back a number of years, but uh, recently have been profiled of patients having an isolated cognitive relapse. That is, no other clinical parameters of a relapse but on uh, measures that have been done prior to and after a certain time at impairment of cognitive measures. And so this is a study following patients with cognitive measures who are otherwise stable over uh, uh, a number of months. And 17 had transient reduction simple digit modality testing, four points or more, and it was not associated with cognitive subjective symptoms or depressive symptoms or other and neurological uh, symptoms. Now, uh, interestingly, there was no clear correlate with MR activity, but we do know that patients can have relapsing symptoms of MS, and we may not see well-defined MRI new lesion activity at that time. So I draw, direct your attention to the concept of cognitive relapses. So now we come to the general question of why would cognitive problems occur in a white matter disease per se? What could be the potential causes or factors that lead into this? And, and the answer is that it's not precisely known at this time, but uh, there's a number of observations that may be worth discussing. So let's, let's do another multiple choice question. So MS cognitive impairment is due to A, a subcortical dementia related to deep white matter change, B, pseudo dementia from depression, D, primarily from cortical demyelination, D, it is not precisely known, or E, cytokine-mediated neural dysfunction. So if you were actually listening to, to me as I was speaking, 
you'll know that it's not precisely known which of these factors, if not all, are involved in MS cognitive impairment. A classic picture of multiple sclerosis one was one of a relative sparing of the axon with injury to the myelin and then a reconfiguration of ion channels in a demyelinated area and then remyelination. Well, we now know that that's not true, that there's some of that, but there also are axons that are degenerated. And because of this, there may be a loss of the entire neuron over time and potentially loss of transsynaptic activity as well. Now, the other thing that we know is that patients can get cortical demyelination. And uh, this has been shown in a number of ways, but we now know that cortical demyelination is not only there, but it's quite extensive. And this is one study from Peterson in 2001, which showed that the mean percent of the area of the cortex that was demyelinated was a quarter of the cortex and varied depending on the area of cortex. So often this was thought of as potentially a late phenomenon seen only at autopsy in the multiple sclerosis population. Well, we now know that's not true. Um, so I'll come to some more evidence on that, but you know, it turns out that the meninges are actually well adapted for the immune system to be quite active in them, and so that there can be a lot of immune cells doing surveillance in the meningeal compartment and in the, you know, CSF compartment, looking at antigens and looking at other phenomena that the immune system uh, needs to oversee, and so that the CSF is not necessarily just a passive sink for uh, debris, but an active part of immune surveillance in the central nervous system. And this is just a picture from uh, Kivasak of T cells scanning antigen-presenting cells in the spinal fluid of healthy mice. And so there's an active surveillance going on in the spinal fluid. We also know that spinal cord EAE lesions are subpeal, and cortical lesions in MS now are seen to be subpeal. And so again, there is an active immunology at the uh, peel boundary of the brain and spinal cord. Perhaps the best human data on this comes from cortical uh, demyelination seen uh, during white matter biopsies. So just to briefly describe this data from Mayo Clinic and other centers where patients had needle biopsies of a white matter lesion and then the cortical component, which was not lesional, was assessed. And what was found that is that in this study where cortical information could be found, 38% of the cortical biopsy material showed uh, demyelinating lesions. And these were patients who had asymptomatic cortical disease, in fact, not visualized cortical disease. So we now know that early on in MS, cortical demyelination occurs. And part of the problem is the MRI is relatively insensitive to showing us these cortical lesions. So it's just an example of a patient in my clinic who has a nice cortical lesion visible on standard imaging, but one may not look for it, and in fact there may be other cortical lesions. If you start looking, you'll make yourself crazy, but the point is that cortical disease is there. We just haven't had a good chance to look at it. All right, well, so cortical disease is probably part of cognitive impairment MS, but there may well be other things in it. And I just listed a whole variety of possible phenomena which may participate in cognitive impairment. So we know about axonal loss, both in the white matter and in the cortex. We know it about arid demyelination and remyelination. But we know that there may be remodeling of ion channels, so maybe this has some impact on processing speed. We know also there's biochemical changes in multiple sclerosis, like nitric oxide changes. So this may have an impact. We know that <clears throat> with activation of cytokines and other immunologically active substances, this may have an impact on cognition and also on signal transmission. There may be transsynaptic changes from demyelinated axons. We also know that our population with MS is actually aging as time goes on, and so there's a concurrent process of cognitive decline, which is uh, normally present. 
and there may be also reduced plasticity to be able to repair areas, and so this may lead into some cognitive impairment. There may be also some cortical remapping, and so with this remapping, there may be fewer areas that can take over function because they're already working overtime, if you will. And then there's a number of other possibilities of concurrent processes. So it's probably a very complex set of issues that feed into cognitive impairment in MS. So to summarize, we know cognitive impairment is common in MS. Cognitive impairment is a source of morbidity and altered quality of life and work. It affects processing speed, memory, and executive function. We know that isolated cognitive relapses can occur. Probably the best bedside tests of value are MOCA test and symbol digit modality test. We know the treatment strategies are unclear, but good general brain health approaches may make sense. And we know that cortical lesions are common and early in MS and may be an important part of the mechanism of MS cognitive impairment. Well, thank you for your attention, and please fill out your information for your CME credit. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Regrant, for this very interesting discussion on the pathophysiology, evaluation, and management of cognitive impairment in patients with MS. We know that cognitive impairment affects many individuals with MS to various degrees. However, cognitive impairment remains under-recognized and under-managed in MS. It is interesting to understand that our means to assess, monitor, and manage cognitive impairment with MS are growing and are supported by an increasing body of evidence. Thank you for your attention.